forget. Like this? Wire down. Wire down. Okay. <coughs> Yeah. 
ซีซาอาเลกันตาอุมเจตนาเชเจเนลอมานาวาเรกิเยเซเนชันเบยิเฮดอทอยีลากงเกปาเตรวาเรกเบดอเจชาวลางเกชาสาราปันเตตาเรละมารมบอเจดะเกเจวะระเตนเดเตนโยเนกะเดชิมเบโกเนเจซอนโกซอนตุเยงอตอตาตอเตนิสันเจนะมะซามะลากะโตเตลิสันเชยุสเตนิส
ตัวสัจจะเกลอดนะสัมปัจจัยยอบายนะงูเนี่ยท่านเนี่ยตัดเตตัดตัวสัจจะเกสัมมนุขะเรตังจิตตะญาณเนี่ยขะเรสัจจ
respond to where you are. Others will seem so advanced that they're almost incomprehensible. So how do we approach them? Well, basically, when a, we find that a song fits you, that it meets you, your needs at this time, then um, take advantage of that. Reflect on its meaning, review it, think about it, try to apply it to your practice and your life. But even when a song is so advanced that you may not be able to understand it, let alone put it into practice, don't be intimidated. The way to approach material that seems too advanced for us when we first receive it is not through allowing ourselves to curl up in intimidate, intimidation, but to approach it with aspiration, to aspire to reach an understanding, in fact, an understanding beyond what is required uh, of the song. Aspiration is tremendously important because it is primarily our aspiration, our motivation, our bodhicitta that causes us to become receptive to the teachings. If we lack aspiration, if we lack the motivation of bodhicitta, then our minds become very, very small, very limited. And you cannot pour very much into a small vessel. On the other hand, if you have this aspiration, this motivation of bodhicitta, you become a tremendous vessel. So instead of being intimidated by the more advanced material contained in, in many of the songs, think, I am a follower of Chechen Bhava Dorje. That being the case, I must eventually, sooner or later, not only equal, but actually surpass, if I can, the level of the disciple for whom this was written. So please listen with that kind of open-mindedness. Oh, oh. ล่ะเสวนาเดิร์บดอมบากเสวนาเนปาสตาวจองสลามนาเจสเซวาเตติตาโกมาอุปาเลเชวาล่ะนันจิกปากตอมบาเจโกเซติฟินโดเตนิเ
We um, are starting on page 131 for those who are following in the English. Um, none of these songs, or almost, almost none of these songs actually have titles. We gave them titles just for the sake of an index. So this one is called uh, Unafraid of Death. The, uh, the introduction to the song says, My disciple from Ojong, Noji, requested instructions that would make him unafraid of death. In response, I wrote this. So the subject of the song is what you need to understand and what you need to practice in order not to be bothered. Uh, the, the Tibetan actually says tsewa, which means bothered by death. Not to be, um, not to uh, view it as a bigger deal uh, than it is. The song begins with one line of Sanskrit, uh, Namo Amitabhaye, which is easy to understand. Rinpoche said it just means uh, prostrations or homage to Amitabha. And then uh, the first three lines can be understood as the, uh, the writer's invocation, but also as instruction. To the protector Amitabha, indivisible from my root guru, I pray with unbearable devotion. You can see this as Chechen Bhavra Dorje's um, introductory prayer in beginning to write the song, but in fact it's, it's actually instruction. That the key point, um, the, the starting point of the song is to, is to um, pray with uh, unbearable devotion, which means devotion that you can't, you can't stand without doing something about it, and doing something about it means uh, praying for your, your root guru, inseparable from Amitabha. And that is the, the first key point for how to deal with, with death, which is devotion for the root guru is seen as inseparable from Amitabha. Next, the song turns to um, the, the essence of practice and says, as soon as recollection arises in your mind, rest in it without alteration. The recollection referred to here basically is the mind uh, being able to uh, be mindful of itself. So it's the mind's non-dual recollection of itself. And therefore, Techen Dorje says, rest in it without alteration, because uh, alteration will constitute straying uh, from that natural recollection. Because it is the mind being uh, mindful of itself, he says, free of viewer and viewed. The, uh, the mind looking at itself is not a subject looking at a, an object. It is something viewing itself. In the next line, he turns to how you deal with distraction. And he says, even if your mind moves, cultivate its nature. Even when a thought arises, still uh, look at the mind itself. And by implication, he's, he's, he's uh, stating that the movement of the mind or the occurrence of thought does not prevent or obstruct this. The other thing that happens in meditation that we fear is dullness. So he says, if torpor arises, increase your exertion. If your mind becomes torpid or dull, then uh, put more energy uh, into uh, the mind's mindfulness of itself. If you recognize whatever thoughts occur, in spite of their being good or bad, they are beyond adoption and rejection. Ramesha said that the point here is when thoughts arise in your mind, either in meditation or post-meditation, if you recognize they're arising and uh, see their nature, the content of the thought, the moral or, or otherwise, is, 
irrelevant. But if you don't recognize the arising of a thought, either it's mere arising or it's nature, then the content is relevant. If you don't recognize the arising of a negative thought, then that negative thought will influence you and you will accumulate negative karma. So when there is no recognition of the nature of thought, the contents of thoughts are relevant and we have to pick and choose. But if there is recognition, um, adoption or rejection uh, are not necessary. In the next uh, lines, Tejan uh, Dorje turns to um, the key points of, a, of approaching or preparing for death. First, he says, always contemplate impermanence and revulsion. Always means throughout our lives. We need to constantly remind ourselves uh, of uh, death, of impermanence, of change. And that in itself will bring revulsion. Revulsion or disgust here doesn't mean feeling sick. It means recognizing that the things to which we attach ourselves are unworthy of attachment because they are impermanent, because we are impermanent. And the second point, always imagine your guru above your head. Turn your mind to him and mix it with his. If you constantly imagine your guru above your head, then that habit will um, uh, assert itself at the time of death and, and after death. Mixing your mind with his means looking at your mind and seeing its nature as inseparable uh, from that of the guru, whom in this case you are imagining above your head. And then it says, at death, Offer your wealth as a mandala. Rinpoche said, I think in this 21st century, um, this requires some explanation. Um, uh, maybe, may, maybe he said, I'm the only one who has a problem with this. Uh, I may be a little suspicious. But it sounds kind of inappropriate um, culturally and, and century-wise. The point of this is to let go. It's not that, oh great, you're dying, you should give your money to the church. It's not a thing of like taking advantage of the fact that a practitioner is dying. The point is, as in all these cases where in these songs it says, give everything you have to your guru, give everything to the Lama, give this to the Lama, give that to the Lama, give the other thing to the Lama. The point is not um, actually the giving. The point is the letting go. Because we are always in danger of being like that guy who died um, with something he valued hidden in his walls, and he died, <clears throat> nobody else knew where it was, so he died pointing to it, you know, um, because that was what was on his mind. And the problem with that is that our state of mind at the moment of death is extremely powerful. It's powerful in the sense of influential. It influences, and to, to a great extent, determines what happens to us after death. So you do not want to die in a state of obsession with anything. Especially, you do not want to die in a state of, of frustrated obsession with your possessions. So the point of this is to um, let go. Now, it's put kind of strongly here because we're talking about the, a critical event, the event of your death. Sometimes in Dharma, it's put more gently. But there are two kinds of instructions where it's put quite, quite strongly. One is uh, when the text presents guidance on the mind itself, uh, in which case the, the, the intention of the text is teaching the person receiving it, how to achieve Buddhahood in one lifetime. And achieving Buddhahood in one lifetime is an extreme thing. So therefore the text will be extreme, extremely strong. And the other context, of course, is here where you're talking about how to ideally prepare yourself for death. So the point is, if you can, 
you want to give away everything and at least let go of everything. And to make that clear, in the next line, Tertrim Bhagavad Dorje says, let go of craving for possessions and loved ones. Because um, if you crave those things that you are losing, because at the moment of your death, you lose all of that. You lose all your loved ones. You lose all your possessions. Um, it's going to make you uh, suffer for no reason. Craving those things at the moment of your death will not help you keep, keep them. You can't keep them. And then it continues, pain and suffering are your mind. Cultivate its nature one-pointedly without distraction. Um, often, uh, perhaps usually, uh, death uh, involves pain, great pain and um, also suffering. In addition to the suffering of the pain, there's the uh, fear, the sense of loss, the uncertainty, and so forth. At this point, and what is recommended is to recognize that these are sensations of and within your mind. They don't exist uh, outside your mind. And so therefore, you use the intensity of the experience to um, allow you to focus one-pointedly uh, on the mind that experiences them. Because the intensity of the sensation, the intensity of the feeling, um, can work two ways. It can either distract you from the mind that feels it, or it can actually, if you know how to do it, bring you to a more intense uh, uh, familiarity with your own mind. ハタテギテギテトラタンホワケドンアコラソンダロステンドトンサルルウマイウマイタソズゲルテタンダランガレクソンデラテネコランルテトンバサワタコランラ<音楽><音楽> ここがんどがてたコロポパンダオテンデセネソンデロソンドクスロソンカンタカイナムナトンサルソスギルテトンヒンサワテネルグウテラザオマネテネコントコバトンバインバチカルポインバナンマバインバカイエル Tilly capo, sendotum, silly, taco got in the capo jigla, semak and do, some jigum, lame lame tucker, yam par, started our gum, started our rang gum yale, the lame tucker layane, yando latin, tilly capo de par, nuna, then a son de hegadas, then a sozuke, ซิมบอลนั้นตะวันนี้โอเคแม่บ้านนี้นะข้างกันเลยว่าเทตาบุมาเนี่ยติดสนุกเห็นได้บ่อยนะเทกับสนเดมตรงที่นี่ให้กระ
So, um, to, 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 to give this some, some section headings that will make it easy to understand, at this point, um, starting with the instruction on um, uh, at death, offer your wealth as a mandala and let go of, of cravings, we're talking about the, the, um, the, what's called the bardo of dying, or the bardo of the time of death. And the instructions for the bardo of dying uh, principally involve what has just been explained and then the following instruction on the ejection of consciousness. Now, <clears throat> to be clear about this, the term that uh, gets translated as ejection or sometimes as transference actually means transition. Uh, it's a general term that means any kind of transition, specifically the transition of death. So the ejection of consciousness is a technique for uh, transitioning or going through uh, the process of death in the best possible way. The, um, the text follows, in the center of your empty clear body is the avaduti. The, the term empty clear body, of course, refers to any, uh, the body as it is, but in this case, by context, it's clear that it refers to the uh, visualization of your body as um, what's called the empty enclosure of the body of a deity. So you would imagine yourself um, as uh, whichever deity uh, is appropriate, whichever deity you are most familiar with, and especially, or in particular, focus on the fact that the body of the deity is um, a membrane of light. That is to say that it's hollow, uh, like a balloon, um, but also the, the skin or membrane that forms the shape is just light. And in the center of that, you visualize the uh, central channel. In this case, no other channels need be visualized. The central channel, or avaduti. It is hollow, white outside, and red inside. The avaduti um, is a hollow tube, also a tube of light. Um, viewed from the outside, it is white, and from the inside, it is red. That, so it's like, a, for example, a wall that is white on one side and red on the other. In this case, white on the outside and red on the in. 
Its top widens, its bottom is sealed. The avaduti ends at what is called the aperture uh, of Brahma, which is a, a, a hole uh, that uh, is at the top of your head. People often mistake where it is. It's slightly back from the, from the top. And um, you imagine that the avaduti widens like the mouth of a, of a horn, uh, uh, like the long uh, Tibetan horn. Well, you can't see it. They're over there. Anyway, um, it, it, it widens like that. And the, the, there are practical reasons for this connected with the technique of, of ejection. But the symbolic reason is that this represents widening the gate uh, to liberation. Similarly, the bottom of the avaduti uh, is closed, like a closed bamboo stalk. So it's closed in the bottom, which represents closing the uh, gate uh, to lower rebirth. So its top widens, its bottom is sealed. Within it, at your heart, on a moon, is your consciousness, a white sphere the size of a pea. So you imagine that your mind, your consciousness, what you think of as you, um, is um, sitting on top of a moon disk in the midst of this avaduti at the level of your heart in the form of a pea-sized uh, sphere or ball of white light. Shoot it repeatedly into your guru's heart. The actual practice of ejection here uh, involves imagining your guru as stated in the beginning of the song, in the form of Amitabha, above your head, and you eject your consciousness, you shoot your consciousness up like a, um, like a, uh, what's that game? Pinball. Yeah, like, like playing pinball, uh, up again and again, uh, out this uh, of a duty into the heart of your guru in the form of Amitabha. And then it says, if you can repeat supplications and hi, there are, um, when you practice this, when you train in this, that you will recite um, supplications, usually to your lineage, to Amitabha, and so forth. And then you'll eject the consciousness several times, uh, exclaiming the sound hi, and um, then you'll chant the supplication again and eject several times, and so on. So he, when he says, if you can, I mean, you're dying, right? So you may not be able to chant stuff and, and, and um, uh, make sounds like a, a dying chihuahua, which are what my hicks sound like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> When I was in retreat, the, my fellow retreatants complained about the, 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 my strangling chihuahuas in my room, which was the sound of my ejection. Thing. If not, the meditation is enough. Um, so you're dying, so you may not be able to uh, make dying chihuahua sounds, but um, if you do the meditation, because you are actually dying, your consciousness is, is, is more pliable and able to leave. Um, so if you even just imagining repeatedly shooting your consciousness up into your guru's heart uh, will be sufficient. You don't have to say the prayers. Now, um, the final instruction for the final period of uh, the bardo of, of dying the bardo of dying ends with when you experience what's called the fundamental clear light or fundamental luminosity. The period where you can perform the ejection of consciousness is when you're dying, death is irreversible, but you're still uh, conscious. But then what happens is your consciousness starts to withdraw. Um, and there are stages to becoming unconscious uh, in death. These stages occur every time we go to sleep, but we don't recognize them. Um, they're, they're, they're grosser during the dying process because it's a, it's, a, it's a much greater transition. Then when appearance, increase, and attainment arise as whiteness, redness, and blackness. These, um, the, the, the 
Paitili Maiti Tisolamna Gajaro. Thank you so much. So the, the way this is explained is that um, because your body is the um, growth of uh, the stuff you got from your parents, there is still a, a, a sort of a, a, a kernel or an essence of each of them located at certain points in your body. And the original, the way it's put is the original, um, uh, it's not the sperm itself, but the original stuff from your father is present um, in your brain uh, toward the top of your head. And the original stuff from your mother is present um, about four finger widths below your navel uh, in the center of your body. And um, what keeps them in place is, what's, is your prana, wh which is also what keeps you alive. So as you die, your prana starts to um, withdraw inward. And as a result, these things move from where they are during life. The first thing that happens is that the, um, the essence of your father's genetic contribution, in the, which is seen as a white sphere of light, starts to descend down your central channel um, into your heart. As that happens, you stop being able to see normal stuff, and everything turns white, like, um, a, like moonlight, but brighter. And at that point, that's called appearance, because um, it's, it's something <laughs> it's appearing. It's not normal. And um, at the same time, all capacity you have for being angry or pissed off stops. As that happens, you stop being able to be angry temporarily. We wish it were permanent, but it's not. Now, when it reaches your heart, the next thing that happens is the um, stuff, the original stuff you got from your mother, which is seen as a, as a, a sphere of red light, rises up, because it's not held down anymore, um, to your heart. And as it does so, everything turns red. And because that's more extreme than the appearance, the white appearance, it's called increase or augmentation. And as that happens, you stop being able to want anything. All thoughts of desire, sexual or otherwise, just vanish temporarily. Then when they meet together in your heart, no matter who you are, you will become unconscious for a moment. And that um, is everything turns completely black. And that's called attainment, not because you actually get anything out of it necessarily, but because you're there. You're at the moment just before death. You're not actually dead yet. But, but they say it's irreversible. They say up to the red thing is reversible, but once you get to attainment, you're, you're not coming back. The reason everything goes black, is, as it's explained, is because the white and red um, drops have covered the, what's called the indestructible um, sphere or indestructible drop in the center uh, of your your heart, and that is the that is the last moment of the bardo of dying. Uh, you're, because the next thing is that you're dead. Now, about the instruction for this, because this is so obviously overwhelming, and also when um, when blackness happens, takes over. You're incapable of any kind of stupid thinking for the first time uh, in your life, and the last time in your life, because it's the end of your life. So he says, then when appearance, increase, and attainment arise as whiteness, redness, and blackness, no matter what happens, cultivate its nature. So the instruction for this is everything turns white, look at the nature of that. Everything turns red, look at the nature of that. Everything turns black, you are going to fade out for a moment. Uh, but if you fade out in a state of awareness, then you'll return in a state of awareness. No matter what appears, look at your own nature. 
there is no dichotomy here between looking at the nature of what appears and looking at the nature of that to whom it appears, because this is your own display. The whiteness is you, the redness is you, the blackness is you. If you become bewildered, think of Sukhavati. If you start to um, freak out, bring Sukhavati, bring the realm of Amitabha to mind. And that is the, really the key point in this whole song. Uh, it returns again and again. It begins with Amitabha and it ends with Amitabha. The key point here is to view your root guru and, and Amitabha as inseparable. Think of suffering as purification. If during this process you become miserable um, because you know you're dying or because you're, you're um, in physical pain or afraid, see it uh, as a purification. Suffering is not purification by itself. It becomes purification if you view it that way. If you view a, an experience of suffering that you cannot avoid as purification, it will serve as purification. And because death is so intense, it will be a great opportunity for purification. Now, that completes the instruction. First, the preparation by letting go, then the practice of ejection, and then uh, viewing the stages of dissolution uh, correctly. That um, concludes the uh, threefold instruction on the bardo of dying. Next, it turns um, to the, the bardo of dharmata. And the bardo of dharmata has two phases. Um, the first is the appearance of the ground luminosity or fundamental clear light, and the second is the appearance of the apparent uh, clear light. During the clear appearance of the first clear light, cultivate your own nature, reunite mother and child. Thank you. The first clear light is when you return to consciousness or awareness after the, that blackness. And everyone does, but most of us don't um, recognize what we're experiencing. And what you are experiencing is the nature of your mind. It's compared to a cloudless a sky at dawn and so on. The, um, the, the instruction to reunite mother and child means that if you have practiced meditation on your mind's nature during the preceding life, what you've cultivated is um, something like, depending upon how good you were at it, something like the actual a clear light. So it's called the child clear light or child luminosity. What you experience at death, what we all experience at death but normally don't recognize is the actual thing, the real thing. And that is called the ground clear light or the mother uh, clear light or luminosity. So if your practice during your preceding life was close enough to the real thing that you recognize it. That's called the reunion of mother and child. The child leaps into her or his mother's lap because they recognize uh, their mother. In the same way, if your practice was, was up to it, you will recognize uh, your mind's nature uh, at that point. So it says, during the clear appearance of the first clear light, cultivate your own nature, reunite mother and child. If you do that, then you achieve uh, liberation uh, in and as the Dharmakaya. And that's the end of the story, except then you benefit beings. If you don't, and we didn't, or we wouldn't be here, when the clear light appears as deities' bodies in the interval of Dharmata, give rise to devotion. They are your own appearance as deities. If you don't, consciousness starts to reemerge from that state of, 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 of pure awareness that was brought on by um, the trauma and transition of death. It first re-arises in a pure form as five-colored light and um, uh, the appearances of various peaceful and wrathful deities. The, the problem is that we don't recognize them. Um, we flee from them. 
we're like somebody who's been told that they're traveling through a dangerous place and that um, and when we see them we think they're the danger actually they're the people who were sent to get us through the dangerous place but we don't recognize them as our bodyguards we think of them as the robbers we're supposed to fear so we flee from them and and, and we do this I mean we've evidently did this or we wouldn't be here so the solution is to give rise to devotion to not flee from the appearances of the deities or the light, but recognize that they are your own appearance as deities. They're not other than you. They are your own nature, your Buddha nature appearing in that way. If you don't recognize them, then the bardo of dharmata ends, and you, your consciousness starts to a coarsen, which is to say more of your... Um, <clears throat> crap comes back online and um, you arise in a mental body that you think is your previous body and at this point it said most people don't even realize they're dead um, they they think that they're they're still alive and they try to do what they did during life and have trouble if you experience bewilderment in the interval of becoming meditate on revulsion for this world the next bardo is called the bardo or interval of becoming because you were in the process of becoming whatever you are going to be uh, next. And this bardo is characterized by all sorts of hallucinations, most of them unpleasant, and by a great deal of fear and by uh, running from things and trying to find shelter. And the shelter that you're looking for is a womb. And so you're trying to, you're trying to get born. Um, so it's, um, we actually do this to ourselves. So the way to prevent um, taking an, an unfortunate birth, he says, is meditate on revulsion for this world. Because it's fundamentally, it's attachment to things that causes us to be reborn. And instead of this world, you seek to be reborn in Sukhavati. To the west is a pure realm. Enter with miraculous power the presence of your guru, Amitabha. You actually have miraculous power uh, in the bardo. Uh, you can go anywhere, pretty much. And so if you remember your guru and see him or her as inseparable from Amitabha and seek to enter their presence, you will. You'll be miraculously born in a lotus and become the equal of all bodhisattvas. Um, once you're born in Sukhavati, regardless of, of how messed up you were before, um, your uh, klesha, uh, your emotional veil, um, is completely eradicated. And uh, you still have a cognitive veil, but you work that out over time uh, there. So the, the, the significance of this is that first of all, once you're born in Sukhavati, you can never return to samsara unless you choose to. And uh, you are incapable of suffering. All suffering comes from uh, the uh, emotional veil. Without the emotional veil, you cannot and will not suffer. So if you want to end suffering as quickly as possible, go to Sukhavati. You'll receive assurance and prophecy. Um, You'll see Amitabha, and he will um, assure you that you, have, uh, you are irreversible from awakening and will um, predict, said, you know, child of family in such and such kalpa, in such and such part of the universe, you will demonstrate perfect Buddhahood, um, and you will be known as Buddha Snodgrass, Buddha such and such, and um, your disciples will be this many and your lifespan will be this long and so on. Think of all this and you'll certainly be born there. If you really want to be reborn in Sukhavati, if you really do, you can. That's all it takes. All you have to do is recollect how great it is and keep it in mind all the time. And then you'll think of it after your death, and bada-bing, bada-boom, you're there. 
For my disciple Norje, this was written by Bauer Dorje. May it lead all who encounter it to the realm of Sukhavati. Tandanina Young Kowalatomame <laughs> Tene Tene pato ni pala longo gongo pato sambala tuko gongo la sang te che che cho songas kasi te ta wo che maso pa ni na tanda te che ng song ba ta to la tene ko lo de wa che ni che kham la tene che wa sho se no molam tam ne da ta wo zo wa ni na ya tene che tu bu yo de te ta wo che ma jong wa ni na ya pa ma chu de che ge tene ko ran je de ng kham de la pa ma chu de ただ Taking 
This instruction is is very clear. And um, it's it's instruction that we can all use, that, that we all uh, need, um, because we are all going to to die. So it's called a song, but um, it's actually you know a instruction, a guidance. The most important thing for us to remember is that now is the most important time in our lives. Because now is when we need uh, to prepare. Now we have the freedom to prepare. And because we have the freedom to prepare, we really have control now over what happens to us when we die. If we let it go, we won't have control then. But now, we have control because we have the freedom uh, to prepare. And we, everything we practice, you could say, is preparation uh, in order to ensure that even if we don't achieve liberation in this life, we achieve it uh, at death. The song talks about the uh, mother and child luminosity, or the ground and path luminosity. The ground luminosity, the ground clear light, the mother clear light, um, is the nature of our mind. It's there all the time. It's pure. It's primordially free of kleshas. We cover it and thereby conceal it with our attachment, aversion, our pride, our jealousy, our stupidity, our bewilderment, and our apathy. But that doesn't change it. And unfortunately, because we cover this with our kleshas, 
we find ourselves in beginningless and potentially endless uh, samsara. But um, right now, whether we continue to cover that or we uncover it is 100% in our hands, up to us. All of the things we do as practitioners, prostration, circumambulation, making offerings, and especially meditation, whether the generation or completion stage, is all done to train ourselves to recognize this ground luminosity. And so everything we practice is the cultivation of path luminosity. Nobody can give us, and for the same reason, nobody can deny us the opportunity or means to recognize our own nature, because it's our own nature. So if we develop an authentic familiarity with that during our practice in this life, then as the song says, the child will leap into her mother's lap, we will recognize our own true nature when we are confronted with it in the bardo, and we will achieve the Dharmakaya. And it is 100% certain that if someone does that, they become Buddha. And their future holds only the benefiting of others without effort or, or concept. But that is not our only chance. Because, as the song um, indicates, if even if we miss recognizing the Dharmakaya, when consciousness resurges, it first does so in a pure form as the Sambhogakaya, the peaceful and wrathful deity. And if we recognize them, then we achieve Buddhahood in the Sambhogakaya. And that's not our only chance either, because after that, when we enter the Bardo of Becoming, its nature is Nirmanakaya. We can recognize its nature and achieve Buddhahood in the Nirmanakaya. And if we can't do that, as the song points out, we can... Uh, aspire to rebirth in Sukhavati, and we're capable in that state of reaching Sukhavati. And even if we can't do that or don't do that for whatever reason, we can choose to be reborn um, as the child of um, spiritually inclined parents. So there are a lot of chances. Basically, we have five chances. We've got the Dharmakaya opportunity, a Samogakaya opportunity, Nirmanakaya opportunity, Sukhavati opportunity, and finally, um, a Dharmic parent opportunity. So there is no need for us to spend 49 days in the Bardo and then go, Rinpoche said, plop down into hell. <laughs> We need to keep this in mind, because this is, um, this is an important time that we experience um, every time we die. And that happens, as we know, again and again and again. So it's worth uh, considering uh, your opportunities and preparing to take advantage of them as best you can. Now, about uh, POA or the ejection of consciousness, um, we put a great deal of emphasis uh, on this practice because the benefits of it are uh, tremendous. Regardless of the person's karma, if a POA is uh, successfully uh, performed, then um, in the best cases, they'll be reborn uh, in a pure realm, in Sukhavati, immediately. Um, and even in the worst cases, if it's successful, they'll be reborn as a human being uh, with access uh, to Dharma. 
And uh, another benefit is it said that anyone who um, benefits from a successful ejection, uh, even if they don't achieve um, liberation during the teaching period of the current Buddha, will definitely achieve it during the teaching period uh, of the subsequent Buddha, so during the teaching period, in our case, of Maitreya. I've practiced, Rinpoche said, I've practiced um, the ejection of consciousness uh, under uh, my father's uh, supervision. When I was seven or eight, and my father was originally a monk of Sermong Monastery, and then he wasn't. And, um, but um, along with him, I performed the, um, the necessary, uh, it, 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 I mean, Rimshi referred to it as a, as a preliminary, but the necessary approach practice of chu or severance, which is called a performance of a hundred severance uh, feasts, which, you know, is, anyway. And that involved a lot of ejection of consciousness. And um, unfortunately, I was al he was always scolding me for this, but I, I didn't know where the aperture was, and I was aiming in the wrong place. Because it's actually a little bit back of the top of your head, and I was assuming it was the fontanelle, you know, in, uh, toward the front. And, um, and um, so I kept on trying to shoot my consciousness out of that, um, which gave me terrible headaches because you actually that doesn't go that way. It doesn't. That's not where it goes. So it it was quite unpleasant, and I got scolded a lot for that. And I was constantly touching here, and yeah. Back and left. That. That's good. Jemachis, so no. ยอดละเกยอดละเกยละดัมเสร็จแล้วเด้อยอดละเกยอดละเกยละดัมบาเจ้าหอนั่นจะปั่นน่ะเจ้าเจ้าเจ้าเลือดตาหลงจะดอก
Sen är det att man kan gå och köra där som man kör. Det är inte något rätt. The next song on page 133 um, deals with the same topic, but um, with a slightly different emphasis because it's written for a different practitioner. And um, we, we gave it the title that's actually the small print at the beginning, Instructions Given to Old Lama Nyua at Chodrak. Now this term, Lagen, or Old Lama, actually doesn't necessarily mean that the person's that old. It can be a term of endearment, a term of, of, of respect tinged with affection that they'll call someone uh, uh, you know lama lagen or you know but but given the subject it seemed appropriate and because tertian bawadorji plays on the term uh, at the end of the song evidently uh, lama nyua from chodrak monastery um, had a, a great meditation practice but was still uncertain about some points so um, Tertian Bawadorje's instructions here uh, answer uh, his, uh, that, that Lama's query, but also um, uh, serve as, as a, a clarification of some of what went on in the <coughs> previous song. It begins with uh, Kieho, and Kieho is, is an expression of calling attention, but it also is an expression of joy. Um, Kiema would be an expression of sadness. Kieho indicates joy. So he, clearly the, the instructions here are going to be about how to approach death with joy rather than um, trepidation. Yogins, when you die, resolve to offer your body and all you own to your guru and the three jewels. So again, the first step uh, in approaching death, so again, uh, during the uh, bardo of dying, the interval of dying, is, and the key, the key word here, as Rimshay pointed out, is resolve. The idea is that you die in a state of resolution. You die in a state where you let go of everything. You're not worried about your stuff. And the traditional way to do that is to think, I have offered everything that I am, everything that I possess, my body, everything I have to my guru and the three jewels. I don't need to worry about it. It's gone. It's taken care of. The second point, no wrongdoing to be with, without essence. Understand that wrongdoing is without essence, empty. So remember that whatever you've done wrong, if you've purified it and admitted it, it, it doesn't have substantial existence. Third point, joyously recollect virtue's benefits. But the good you've done, especially if it's been dedicated to, to perfect awakening, that is something that you can contemplate with joy. So the first point is to let go of everything. Second point is to consider wrongdoing. Third point is to recollect virtue. And the fourth point is, imagine your guru always above your head during life um, and especially when you're dying. Cultivate the nature of your mind indivisible from your guru. So imagining your guru above your head, then you look at the nature of your mind and you sustain it recollecting that that nature is the same as the nature of your guru's mind. Now, from the, from the fact that there is no instructions on the ejection of consciousness in this song, we can infer that this uh, Lama Nyua had reached a point uh, where such means were no longer required. Because Terchen uh, Bawadorji in this song basically goes through the four principal bardos and, and describes how to relate to each of them. Now, in the previous song, we saw the bardo of dying, the bardo of dharmata, and the bardo of becoming. Here, um, he's going to place them in the larger context by mentioning the fourth bardo, which is the one we're in right now, the bardo of between birth and death. And he says, this interval between birth and death is like a dream. We normally think that this life is real. Um, dreams are not real, but this is real. This is not like a dream. And um, 
our reasons for believing that are basically that we, there's an agreeable shared reality that we can communicate to or with others, and therefore we think it must be real because I'm not the only person that sees it. And it goes on for a long time. So therefore, we consider it to be real. Well, why do we think that dreams are not real? Dreams are not real for two reasons. They end. The main reason is they end. And the second reason is that when we wake up from a dream, we think that what we wake up to is more real than the dream. So we use dreams as a principal analogy for illusion because uh, we think that they're illusory. They end, and we wake up from them. Well, hello. <laughs> Those two criteria for being illusory apply equally to this life. This life will end. And when it ends, we will wake up from it to something more real, ideally, the ground clear light. So there is no reason to think that this life is the real thing. And dreams are not the real thing. Dreams are not the real thing, but neither is this life. Because it ends, and we wake up from it to a greater level of authenticity or reality. So this interval between birth and death is like a dream. Don't suffer through fear of death, yogins. Our fear of death is ultimately as irrational as if we were afraid of waking up from a dream. Next he turns to the, um, the bardo, the, in this classification, the bardo of dying actually ends, when the bardo of dharmata is separately enumerated, the bardo of dying actually ends with the um, experience of the ground clear light, the moment of death. So for the next uh, instruction, he says, meet the dharmakaya in the reunion of the mother and child clear lights. And this is a brief statement of what was described uh, in the, the previous song through uh, practice in this life, cultivate the child clear light or child luminosity, the path luminosity, to such an extent that you can recognize the ground clear light, the mother clear light or luminosity, at the moment of death. And then for the interval of dharmata, meet the Sambhogakaya deities during the interval of dharmata. In other words, death is your gateway to the Dharmakaya, and if you screw that up, the Sambhogakaya. It's not something we should fear. Purify the illusory body with the clear light during the interval of becoming. Um, a, one technique of traversing the interval of becoming, the bardo of becoming, if one doesn't recognize the ground clear light or the Sambhogakaya deities, is um, once you recognize that your a body is a, a mental body, an illusory body, um, you can actually uh, dissolve it into the clear light um, if you've been trained in that during the practice in your life, and that will purify it. Dispatch Nirmanakayas for beings good during the interval of the birthplace. The interval of the birthplace is sometimes refers to this, the interval between birth and death, and sometimes it's the, used to mean the final moment of the uh, interval of becoming. It's actually the segue between the two. The, so in other words, if you're conscious, if you choose um, your parents consciously, you uh, can um, dispatch. Uh, you can multiply and dispatch nirmanakayas um, uh, in the process of, of conscious rebirth. They are all dharmata, empty in nature. All four phases or intervals are fundamentally dharmata. 
because the ground from which all appearances arise is the same. So therefore, the appearances are the appearances of that ground. When they appear as pure appearances, we call that the bardo of dharmata, and when they appear as what we think of as impure appearances, we call it the bardo between birth and death, the bardo of becoming, and the, the bardo of dying. Look at the spectacle of their unlimited illusory display. If you are aware of what's going on, as presumably this Lama Nyua was capable of being, then this is all entertainment. It's just like watching, you know, one movie after another. Um, there, it's just a, it's just a display. It's just something you're, you're watching. Now the next stanza gives very um, significant practical advice in how to relate to the stages of, of dying. While undergoing sickness, pain, fluctu fluctuating lucidity and dullness. So um, for a practitioner, the, the concern is I'm going to be very, very sick, I'm going to be in a great deal of pain, and my mind's not going to be necessarily that clear. Um, what do I do about this? So while undergoing sickness, pain, fluctuating lucidity and dullness, and the three stages of death, appearance, increase, and attainment, there is nothing to do but cultivate awareness of self-recognition. The key point here is to understand that other than allowing your mind to recognize itself, allowing your awareness to recognize itself, nothing else is necessary. There's nothing better than that. There's nothing more than that. You don't need to add anything to that. Give up any idea that there is anything better than that to do or think about. Because that is the reason for which we do all this other stuff. So if you can do that, you're doing the thing that is the purpose of all the other stuff. There is nothing at all other than cultivating just this mind itself. If you can die doing that, then no, other means are not required. Old Lama, your uncertainty and question have been answered by this verbose old mantra in this introduction. So whether Techen Bawa Dorje was of a great age when he wrote this or not, he calls himself an old mantra. You know, Baba Yena Drukchu, the Da Lord Zosan Segadwa. Drukchu Tambalas. You know, you need to take the word old with a grain of salt here because Tibetans say, Well, I'm 60, my life's over. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, I've reached, because. I mean, no matter how much you go, mumble songs, that drugs you love, love song, that meets it's all songs. You know, lamas will say like, "Oh, I'm 60 now, my life's over. Anything else is just free." So, it was written down by Dulwa as I spoke. Dulwa was one of Teichen Bawe Dorje's attendants, uh, attendants, Kama Dulwa, and he wrote a lot of, uh, took a lot of, uh, not only songs but other um, uh, treasures and so on as dictation. May you reach the city of the clear light, the Dharmakaya. ハドギニャムネコアラレンドワス。タテンドカトラゴネ、ソコニカテペガランケネヤゴンドテンデゲドウス。ヤポンドテンデゲドタレンジェナバゴンバカレヨテンデハモゴテ。テンドカトラタン
ทนเจทามาเตงอมตาชิมบอนดาเจเชสเซงเกตเมนตะคอยอนเตนิตาตะกอนเกนดาเจติเลนดาเจยอเรติเตเปนะฮิดามันดวาเซลาเซบอนด